Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Last time we covered Ghosts Can't Do It, one of two films that won the Razzie for Worst Picture of 1990. Today we are looking at the film that shared this honor. The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, starring comedian Andrew Dice Clay. And what can I say about the Dice Man that hasn't already been said? The term controversial feels inadequate. When most people think of comedians who push the envelope, Dice will probably be near the top of their list. He was loud, he was brash, he was offensive, and he was in your face while sporting ridiculous leather jackets, fingerless gloves, and a fake Brooklyn accent. You know what's funny? Even though I know he's not really Italian, it still feels wrong whenever I hear him speak with his normal voice. Dice got his big break in the late 1980s with a performance on a Rodney Dangerfield HBO special and quickly rose to prominence. He soon found himself doing his own comedy specials on HBO and pay-per-view and sold out Madison Square Garden for two consecutive nights, the first comedian to do so. Some people loved him, some people hated him, either way he was a household name. Personally, I've always found him to be hit and miss. There are times when he can be very funny. I love his dirty nursery rhymes just as much as anyone. Little boy Bloom! He needed the money, oh! Though I was never really a fan of his tendency to yell, oh, at the end of every joke. I know it's part of his shtick, but it just sounds silly to me. Like he needs to remind his audience, yes, that was indeed the punchline and you can laugh now. But there are times when his material is just hateful claptrap with a comedy varnish. And I can already see the comments now. You mad, bro? Huh? You mad? You offended, bro? You PC, bro? You mad? Let me make this clear. The only kind of joke I find offensive is one that is not funny. So yes, yeah, sometimes I do find him offensive. I think comedy is at its best when it's punching up. Dice tends to punch down, and I don't really find that funny. Now whenever someone asks Dice why he says the things he does, he's quick to point out that he doesn't actually mean anything by it, he's just playing a character. Andrew Dice Clay is an over-the-top persona and completely different from the man known as Andrew Clay Silverstein. And honestly, I buy that. Pretty much anyone who has ever met him has said he's one of the nicest guys on the planet. One of his Ford Fairlane co-stars, Priscilla Presley, described him as, quote, a teddy bear. He's even been described as a romantic. Of course, he's been divorced three times, but hey, who's counting? That said, sometimes the lines between the character and the man can get a little blurry. The night before The Adventures of Ford Fairlane hit theaters, Clay made an appearance on the Arsenio Hall show where he gave an impassioned speech about how hard he had worked to make this movie and actually appeared to almost tear up. But then he quickly reverted to his dice persona and recovered. This blurring up the lines between the man and the character led some people, including members of his own family, to suspect the whole thing was an act. And honestly, I'm not really sure myself. Nevertheless, I don't believe Andrew Clay Silverstein is a bad person. I understand that when he's Andrew Dice Clay, he's playing a character, and that character's views do not necessarily reflect his own. And that's all well and good, but why does the audience like this character? Why do they find him funny? I mean, I know comedy is subjective, and maybe I'm just an SJW, a cuck, a libtard, a soy boy, or any other terms that have been overused to the point where they've lost all meaning. But I don't get what's supposed to be funny about calling women piglets and homosexuals faggots and saying shit like, Japs and chinks are all the same. And yes, that is an actual line from his HBO special, The Dice Man Cometh. They're all the same, Japs, chinks, it's all the same shit. I mean, that's not even a joke. That's a line you hear from your racist uncle that makes Thanksgiving dinner awkward. So what makes it funny when Dice says it? Back in the day, I could maybe understand if it was the shock value, but he's been doing his thing for 30 freaking years. The shock should have worn off by now. And I don't know if Dice is necessarily to blame for any of this. I mean, he's not putting a gun to anyone's head and forcing them to watch his show. But there comes a time when you have to ask yourself, am I catering to an audience of assholes? Granted, that can be a very lucrative business. Just look at Fox News. Oh, ah, oh, great, now I'm doing it. Uh, I had to watch a lot of Dice's stand-up to prepare for this review, and now it's ingrained in my skull. Now, I shouldn't have to spell this out, but this doesn't mean all offensive comedy is automatically bad. I've enjoyed the work of plenty of comedians who could be considered offensive. Chris Rock, George Carlin, Joan Rivers, Richard Pryor, Mel Brooks. So why do I like them and not Dice? Well, I think it mostly comes down to context. 
When they're saying offensive shit, there's a point to it. They're telling a story, sending a message, pointing out absurdities or injustices in life. Take this scene from one of my favorite movies of all time, Blazing Saddles, which was written by two of the people I just mentioned, Pryor and Brooks. If you haven't seen the movie... You haven't seen Blazing Saddles? What's the matter with you? But anyway, let me set the scene for you. Bart, played by Cleveland Little, has just been appointed sheriff of an Old West town, and the town's residents are not too happy about the fact that their new sheriff is, well... The sheriff is a nick! But Bart has optimism to spare and is in no way deterred. He's going to win over the hearts and minds of this town and overcome their prejudices by God. And eventually, he does. But it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, good morning, ma'am. And isn't it a lovely morning? Up yours, digger. As you may have noticed, that scene contains a racial slur. But they're not saying the N-word just for funsies. It's part of an actual joke with a setup and a payoff. And it works. It's portraying racism without being racist in and of itself. Hell, the entire point of the movie is to show how absurd racism is. And that's why I prefer the comedy of someone like Mel Brooks over Dice. The former is offensive to make a point. The latter is offensive for the hell of it. And to me, that's not comedy. That's just being a dick. And let's be honest, he was always the poor man Sam Kinison anyway. Oh, where was the lie? Where was the lie? So not being a huge fan of Dice, I can't say I was really looking forward to The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, even though Dice is legitimately a good actor. In recent years, he's had critically acclaimed supporting roles in Blue Jasmine and A Star is Born. Which I finally got around to watching, by the way, and it is as good as you've heard. And Dice is really good in it as Lady Gaga's father. But here's the problem with his performance in The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. You know how in No Holds Barred, Hulk Hogan was playing a character called Rip? but Rip was basically just Hulk Hogan under a different name, like he was even the World Wrestling Federation champion and everything? Well, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane is basically the same situation. Dice plays Private Dick Ford Fairlane, who drives a Ford Fairlane because of course he does. And Ford is different from Dice in name only. He's playing the exact same character from his stand-up routines. Which raises the question, why didn't they just call this The Adventures of Dice? At least it would have been truth in advertising. He's got the same hair, the same clothes, the same fake accent, the same mannerisms, and the same lazy jokes. This is the first thing he says after waking up in bed the morning after bringing two women home. Do my dishes! Ford, you ain't got no dishes to do. The only way you could have dishes to do is if you actually cooked food the night before. And you look like the kind of guy who lives on a steady diet of cigarettes and Chinese takeout. They also include bits from Dice's stand-up routines, even though this character is totally different from Dice. Really? And what are your names? Neil and Bob? Is that like what you're doing? It's to you. Suck in my dick! <laughs> money, 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 Every time he makes that sound, I can't tell if he's having a seizure or an orgasm. Maybe both? There's even a line where Ford mentions he was banned from MTV, which happened to Dice after he told his dirty nursery rhymes during the VMAs in 1989. Speaking of which, and I'm sorry I've spent more time ranting about Dice than his movie, but one of the things I keep hearing about nowadays is the pussification of America. Go ahead and look up any video of Dice on YouTube, or really any YouTube video nowadays, and you'll find the same thing in the comments. America's so pussified now, bro. Everything's so PC now, bro. Why is everyone so offended, bro? And I look at all these comments, and I just cannot help but wonder, have these motherfuckers not paid any attention at all to Dice's career? I swear, all of these dumbasses act like political correctness and protests and cancel culture are all recent phenomenons. But if you take even a cursory glance at the history of Dice's act, that theory falls flat on its face. Dice pissed off a lot of people back in the day, and he was protested all the time by women, people of color, LGBTs, you name it. He was supposed to get a one-hour drama on ABC back in 1993, but they dropped it because he was deemed too controversial for the network. 20th Century Fox actually shelved his concert film, Dice Rules, ultimately selling it to another studio and washing their hands of it. This was a quarter of a century ago, and people still act like political correctness only came about recently, as if there was some magical period in history where we didn't have censors. Newsflash, we've always had censors. It's not like we all woke up one day and all of a sudden, oh, 
We have standards now. How'd that happen? We've always had standards, but standards are not static. They evolve over time. People evolve. Comedy evolves. Society evolves. And there are two ways you can respond to evolution. You can either evolve yourself or get left behind like a friggin' Neanderthal. Those are your choices. I leave it to you. Oh, and one more thing regarding MTV giving DICE a lifetime ban. We're all in agreement that was bullshit, right? And I don't mean it was wrong for MTV to ban him, I mean the ban was never legit. I don't buy for a second that the producers didn't know what DICE was going to say before he walked out on stage. The whole thing reeks of a publicity stunt. DICE has even said in interviews that his career got a huge boost after the ban, which is true. And let's not forget he made a brief appearance at the 1992 VMAs making fun of what happened three years prior. That's it. Three years. Lifetime bans in professional wrestling have lasted longer. And let's also not forget, MTV actually allowed their brand to be used in the adventures of Ford Fairlane. They even loaned out MTV news correspondent Kurt Loder. Why would they do that for a guy they banned for life? Yeah, I'm calling it. It was a stunt. We've been had. Anyway, I'm supposed to be reviewing a movie. The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, Rock and Roll Detective. Fun fact, the film was directed by the same guy who did Cutthroat Island. Not a good sign. But it does star Robert Englund and Ed O'Neill. That's not a bad sign. And we have Morris Day in a supporting role, and he was pretty funny in Purple Rain. Plus special appearances by Sheila E. and Tone Loke. And yes, that is how you pronounce his name. I know this because I took five seconds to look him up on Wikipedia. So given the movie does have at least some level of talent involved, how bad could it be? Pretty bad, it turns out. The first problem is, despite starring one of the biggest stand-up comedians of the time, it's really not funny. And even as someone who was never a huge fan of Dice, I'm honestly surprised by that. It's not that the movie isn't funny, it's that it's not putting much effort into being funny. It doesn't help that a good number of the jokes are just recycled from Dice's stand-up, although a couple have been given a new twist. Clint Eastwood. I fucked them. Oh! <laughs> Apparently, Ford is openly bisexual. But even most of the new jokes aren't good. There's this weird running gag with a koala that was gifted to Ford by one of his clients. Of course, it's not an actual live koala, it's a puppet, because the filmmakers thought the gopher in Caddyshack was hilarious. But the difference between Caddyshack's gopher and Ford Fairlane's koala is the koala doesn't actually do anything. It just shows up once in a while. Just to remind you that it's there. Until Ford gets too close to solving the case and someone hangs it from his ceiling fan as a threat. Comedy! Oh, but don't worry, he got better. You didn't really think we'd kill the fucking koala fan now, did you? Well, kinda. That's not to say the movie is completely devoid of good jokes. Ford occasionally gets into arguments with a police officer played by Ed O'Neill, and their banter is actually kind of amusing. And there's this moment where Priscilla Presley's character explains why she's not easily offended. When I was 11, I walked in on my father in the Shetland pony he gave me for my 10th birthday. Well, isn't that special? Does that excite you? I don't know. I never met your father. <laughs> See, that was actually funny. Now, why couldn't the movie have had more of that and less of that goddamn koala? The movie also makes a lot of random ass references, most of which are from much better movies than this one. There's a character named Zuzu Petals, a reference to It's a Wonderful Life. Gilbert Gottfried recites the She's My Sister and My Daughter bit from Chinatown for no reason. And there's a moment where Ford shouts, Top of the world, ma! Similar to James Cagney in White Heat. And all of this is just reminding me of movies I could be watching instead of this. But probably the most bizarre reference comes at the beginning of the film. Ford is known as the rock and roll detective as his clientele are primarily from the music industry. And when we first meet him, he's trying to track down some creep that's been stalking a band known as the Pussycats. Been showing up at that concert saying he wants to rape and kill him, and not in that order. Comedy! And believe it or not, the lead singer's name is actually Josie. Josie and the Pussycats. Of all things they could put in a vehicle for Andrew Dice Clay, I did not expect a Hanna-Barbera reference. Side note, Josie and the Pussycats is a criminally underrated movie. But the movie's biggest problem is it just makes no damn sense. The plot is a confusing mess. I will try to summarize as best as I can, but I apologize if we get lost along the way. Ford is a private dick, with the emphasis on dick. 
He has an assistant named Jazz, played by Lauren Holly, one of the few likable characters in the movie, and a child sidekick that pops up every once in a while because he wants Ford to track down his father. Spoiler alert, his father is dead, which makes this subplot kinda pointless. Now you might be wondering, why would they give Dice a child sidekick? Well, why would they give him a fucking koala bear? You expect me to make sense of this? I don't know what Rennie Harlan was smoking when he made this movie, but it must have been some good shit. Ford begins the movie desperate for cash because, for some reason, working for musicians doesn't pay well. Even though these rich rock stars could most definitely afford to pay him in actual money, they prefer to give him cheap, useless gifts, like the aforementioned koala. And Ford just goes along with it. Why would he continue to be a rock and roll detective when there's clearly no money in it? It made sense to specialize. Did it, though? But he finally gets a case that could actually net him some honest-to-God cash. Early in the film, a metal singer named Bobby Black, played by Vince Neil, mysteriously drops dead on stage during a concert. Oddly enough, Vince is singing a Motley Crue song, Rock and Roll Junkie, even though the rest of the crew are not in the movie. And I like Motley Crue, but this movie is doing a really good job of reminding me that Vince Neil was never a very good singer. After Black's death, Ford is hired to track down a girl by the name of Zuzu Petals, played by Maddie Corman, by two different people. An old friend turned shock jock, played by Gilbert Gottfried, and some rich lady named Colleen Sutton, played by Priscilla Presley, in the only movie she did that wasn't part of the Naked Gun franchise. Supposedly, Zuzu has some connection to the shock jock and the rich lady, but it's never made clear. The shock jock claims to be her father, Colleen claims to be her sister, but it's implied both could be lying, and already I'm terribly confused. Ford eventually finds her and basically becomes her protector, and a good thing too since there is no shortage of people trying to get their hands on her. One of those people is Freddy Krueger with a British accent. Why does he have a British accent? Well, originally Billy Idol was supposed to play this part, but he had to pull out after a motorcycle accident. So they gave the part to Robert England, and I guess they just had him talk like Billy Idol. Comedy? And Ford does everything he can to kill this psychopath. He brains him with a TV, crashes his car, throws him off a building, but he keeps coming back. It gets ridiculous after a while. Hey, aren't you supposed to be dead? Ford also has to contend with these two motorcycle riding bozos in one of the movie's more ridiculous scenes. Through a wacky turn of events, Ford ends up at a sorority house for Iota Ada Pie, which Ford incorrectly refers to as I Ada Pie. Get it? The bozos track him down after conveniently showing up at his office right when he just happens to call and check in with Jazz, and then they throw her out a second story window, which she somehow survives. You know, I will give the movie credit for not fridging Jazz. That honestly surprised me. They park their motorcycles outside the sorority house, but then Ford sneaks out the back and releases the brake on a nearby vet convertible, crashing it into the bikes. One of the bozos then throws a grenade into the car. I'm not sure why he did that, or why he had a goddamn hand grenade in the first place. And after they blow up the vet, for no reason whatsoever, they're seen riding off on another bike. But I thought the vet just crashed into their bikes, but now they're on another bike? Where did they get the bi- I- God, I have no idea what's going on. Anyway, Jazz eventually figures out that Colleen is the ex-wife of record mogul Julian Grendel, played by Wayne Newton, who has apparently been losing money due to music piracy. And this was almost a decade before Napster, when piracy actually required some effort. So Ford thinks he has the case cracked, and Colleen is behind the piracy. This would make sense. So naturally, it's wrong. <laughs> no, Julian is responsible. Apparently, he's been pirating his own label's music. You heard that right. The owner of the record label has been bootlegging his own product. And he killed Colleen, Bobby Black, and the Shock Jock once they found out. He also tried to kill Morris Day, but he doesn't seem to know anything about Julian's scheme. Julian wants him dead just because. And he's been after Zuzu because she has a CD with proof of Julian's misdeeds, because he was dumb enough to keep records of his criminal activities. But the CD can only be read if it and two other CDs are put into a computer at the same time, and one of those CDs was hidden under Art Mooney's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and oh my god can this get more convoluted. You sick, confusing motherfuckers. But why has Julian been screwing over his own business? Well, apparently he was upset because the artists on his label were making more money than him. 
This movie must take place in some kind of alternate reality because since when does that happen? It's amazing how much you gotta pay the actual artists who create the music, huh? Oh, come on. How tone deaf can this movie get? Since when do the artists get paid more than the record label execs? That's not how this works. And how exactly is he able to make more money bootlegging his own product than just selling the real thing? None of this makes any sense. Anyway, Julian is ultimately exposed, and then Ford burns him alive. Jesus. Although, given how many times Robert Englund should have died in this movie, he'll probably just walk it off. Speaking of which, Freddy does eventually die for real after Ford challenges him to a hand-to-hand -hand fight. And when Freddy accepts, Ford just shoots him. And that's actually kind of awesome. I mean, who the hell would throw their guns down and fight mano a mano? That never happens in the real world. Well played, Ford. Well played. Well, that's the adventures of Ford Fairlane. It's crap. Sure, it had two or three legitimately funny moments, and a pretty good musical number where Dice sings, I ain't got you. Credit where it's due, Dice has a good set of pipes. And the acting was surprisingly decent overall, England's fake accent notwithstanding. I'm honestly surprised the Razzies nominated Gottfried and Newton for worst supporting actor and not him. I thought Newton played his part perfectly, and Gottfried... Well, that one I get. But most of the jokes fell flat, the story made about as much sense as Nirvana lyrics, and having Dice play himself, while technically not playing himself, was just stupid. While the movie had a decent opening weekend, especially considering competition from movies like Die Hard 2 and Ghost, it had a sharp drop in week two, and after three weeks it was gone. Dice claimed in an interview that the movie was pulled from theaters after the first week due to political correctness, but it actually played in about the same number of theaters during all three weeks of its run. And despite the poster leading you to believe this movie was designed to offend pretty much everyone, compared to the average Dice stand-up routine, it's actually fairly tame. The movie did not fail due to political correctness. It failed because it sucked. That's it. The movie won three Razzies that year. Worst Actor for Dice, Worst Screenplay, which was well-deserved, and of course it tied for Worst Picture. And much like the first time the Razzies had a tie for Worst Picture, I do not agree with this decision at all. Ford Fairlane may be terrible, but compared to Ghosts Can't Do It, it's a goddamn masterpiece. At least Harlan and Dice appear to have a basic understanding of how movies are supposed to work, even if their execution was flawed. At least the movie was competently edited. At least it had at least one likable character. At least it didn't have Donald Trump. I realize these bars are low enough to trip over, but the Derricks still failed to clear them. How the Golden Raspberry Foundation could call this a tie is beyond me. Ghost Can't Do It is the inferior film, and it's not even close. As for The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, unless you're a die-hard Andrew Dice Clay fan, there's not much here to recommend. It's not funny enough to be entertaining, and it's not offensive enough to be noteworthy. It's just kind of there. Instead of watching Ford Fairlane, watch Josie and the Pussycats. I'm serious, that movie does not get enough love, and I will die on this hill! Next time, we're going to move on to the year 1991 and the star of Die Hard, in a movie that's nowhere near as good as Die Hard. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood, here's to you. Suck in my dick. Oh! Sometimes you can be a real dick.